The trail was bringing us back to the starting point. Or was it the map? I rested my back on a nearby tree away from the entrance to the cave, and Roxy was sighing heavily. I was about to throw it in her face that it was her fault that we were hiking in circles on the weekend of my birthday, but the way she was made me stop. It wasn't entirely her fault, she simply wanted the best for me. I grew up as a lonely kid. My parents abandoned me in an orphanage when I was five, and I couldn't make friends with the other children because they thought I was proud. When I got adopted some months later, I was the only child, too. They were rich and caring people, but they died too soon, leaving me their fortune and all alone. The world was too large, but I learned to get by on my own with no friends or family. It was the same through high school and college. I met Roxy at my place of work. She was an easygoing, jovial fella. It was hard not to be friends with her. Although I still didn't make friends with her. I wouldn't have if she wasn't so persistent. Roxy and I shared the same office, and it was the first time I wasn't lonely and couldn't do things on my own. For every single thing, she was on my neck asking for guidance. It made me angry at first, but when I realized it wasn't because she was clueless, but rather because she wanted to continue conversing with me, my heart was moved. Soon we had dinner together, and sleepovers, and ladies' dates, and before I knew it, for the first time, I was out of the cage of loneliness. After working closely with Roxy for three years, I got close enough to share my worries with her, and confide in her, and we became more than just friends. We were popular best friends at work. Roxy was even the first person I told that I was adopted. Of course, she found it hard to believe, considering the houses and real estate documents, plus lots of money my adopted parents had left for me. This was the reason why I didn't reject her suggestion to go camping and hiking for my birthday celebration. This was coupled with the fact that I secretly longed to go on the sport, but nothing was going as planned on the hill. We arrived on Friday night after work and shopping for the weekend getaway. It felt cool to try out something both of us had never done. When we arrived at the venue, we set up our tents, talked, and dived into secrets we never shared with anyone else. It was cool, and one of the things I loved the most about Roxy. We retired late in the night. When we awoke the next morning, it was time to go hiking. We got ready, but the map was missing. We searched everywhere, the tents, our backpacks, the extra bags, everything, but we couldn't find it. The moment we would have given up, between our tents, we found a map. It looked old and tattered, but it was similar to ours and had an outline of the mountain. With joy, we embarked on the hiking journey, following the map closely. The issue was that we never got around for six minutes before we got back to exactly where we started from. We tried different trails each time, following different paths, but we still ended up back in front of the cave, a few meters from our tents. It was weird because the cave was not on the map, and we could only see our tents. There was no clear path or road to reach it. Now, at first, I thought we made a mistake. But a mistake was supposed to happen only once or twice, not six times. By now, Roxy and I were scared, but we pretended not to be. We couldn't even run back to our tents, even if we wanted to. I backed up from the tree and moved closer to Roxy. I pulled a bottle of water from her backpack and drank very fast, trying to quench my anxiety like it was thirst. I was trying to return the bottle when a lady raced towards us from the cave. She was dressed like a hiker, but with no backpack and no map. Or I was mistaken, there was a map similar to ours in her hand, old and torn. Her face was puffy, and her cheeks sagged like she'd been crying for a while. Are you lost too? She asked as she got closer to Roxy and me. We nodded, not knowing what to say for the surprise of seeing someone else that seemed as clueless as we were. I lost my map over the night, and after searching for so long, I finally found this. She held up the old map in her hand. I thought it was quite fine since it was similar to the one I lost, but it keeps leading me down here. It's no help. Tears filled her eyes, and even though Roxy and I were in the same situation, we couldn't help but sympathize with her. We were at least eight years older than she seemed to be. We were about to talk, or at least I was 
when we heard sounds coming from inside the cave. We didn't get a chance to say anything before the young girl grabbed our hands, making us run. Roxy ran behind, but at a slower pace. What's wrong? Roxy asked. Wild dogs! I was running from them when I saw you! Roxy started to quicken her pace. Dogs were out of the cave and were closing in on us because their bark sounded louder and closer. I turned to hurry Roxy up, the young girl pulling me away with her youthful energy. The moment I turned, I caught sight of a dog that was grabbing at Roxy with its paws and teeth. I shouted at her to run, but I was too late. Roxy was shouting my name as the dog grabbed her. The other dog joined the hunt and brought her down. I would have run back, but the young girl was too busy escaping while holding my hand. I watched with horror as the dogs made my best friend their food. I couldn't save her. The young girl and I found a way to escape, and we were back at our tents. I tried to search for Roxy, to hear her sounds or footsteps, but there were none. I went back home that afternoon completely devastated. Roxy was gone, and just as it was destined for it to be of me, I was all alone once again. My nights were never the same because I had the same dream over and over again. The hungry, wild eyes of a wild dog gobbling up the flesh of my best friend. The tearing claws and the paws of the wild dogs injuring her to the bones, killing her, taking her away from me forever. We shouldn't have gone hiking that weekend. Too scared to subscribe? <laughs> Me and my buddies are huge into hiking, and although we don't go so much anymore, we used to get at least one or two trips in every summer, heading out to various bucket list hiking spots all over the US. For the most part, the scariest thing to happen to us was having to take those outside poops, which, believe me, can be truly terrifying sometimes when you don't have the right kind of tree to balance yourself on. But this one time, we did find something that seriously creeped us all out and that I find myself thinking about every so often. Even all these years later, it still sends shivers down my spine whenever I think about it. This happened in Yellowstone about eight years ago, and after setting up camp on some lower terrain near a lake, we decided to hike up the mountains at almost 10,500 feet above sea level. The views were incredible, but when we were up there, one of my buddies calls out to come look at something he'd found, and when we do we see that he's found a horse skull. There was no meat left on it, like the thing was totally bone dry, so we take some pictures of it, joking about how spooky and old west it looked, then headed back down to camp. We get back to camp, and we're all sweaty, so we decide to head down to the lake to take a dip so we could get clean. We didn't want to see each other all naked and stuff, so we decided to really spread out along the shoreline. It was all ridgy and was dotted with the trees, so if we spread out far enough, we all could get a little privacy so we could strip down and actually get washed properly without worrying about each other seeing our junk. You know how that goes. Then, no sooner had I actually gotten down to my undies, I hear one of the guys shouting like, You gotta come see this. We all put our books down, and even though some of us were in nothing but our underwear, we all went to check out what one of us had found. I remember having to climb up this little ridge so I could get to where he was calling from, but when I did, the thing was big enough that I didn't have to walk any further to see what he had seen. It was a horse, a dead one, and it was missing its head. As you can guess, we instantly started thinking that the horse skull that we'd found was the one missing from our dead horse but we basically had to dismiss that idea based on one big reason. Like I said, the horse head was completely clean of any meat, and it was totally dry, whereas the headless horse we found was still rotting. I don't know if there's a way of stripping all the meat from a skull and drying it that fast, but it seemed kind of unlikely that the two were connected. Besides, there's plenty of wildlife around Yellowstone that might rip a stray horse's head off, right? Then suddenly, as we're all stood around gopping at the dead horse, one of us is like, dude, is that film? It was. 
Near the headless horse was all this old school camera film half buried among the pebbles, and when our buddy picked up a piece of it and held it up to the light, he just let out this slow, freaked out, dude. Me and this other buddy of ours scrambled down the ridge to check out what he was seeing, and when he handed me a piece, you could clearly see the negatives were of the headless horse. We spent a whole minute just passing the negatives around in silence, each wondering who would take pictures of something like that, especially with an old school camera when almost everyone under the sun has a zillion megapixel camera phone. Then we started to wonder if the person responsible for taking the pictures was also somehow responsible for actually cutting the horse's head off or something. In which case, how did they get the skull like that? Or maybe they'd done it before and the dry skull was from a completely different occasion. Then it dawned on us. The film had some pebbles over them and it sure made it look like they were half buried and had been there for a while. But then again, there was hardly any damage or wear or tear to them, so it was more than likely that whoever had left them there had deliberately weighed them down to stop them blowing away or something. But that meant that they had only been placed there recently, which meant whoever took the pictures might still be around somewhere, maybe even somewhere close. That's when we started to get really spooked because it was all one thing to find something so weird out there in the middle of nowhere, another thing entirely when we might run into the person that did it. We got out of there pretty fast after that. Even though we were exhausted, we knew better than to hang around the area and take a chance when it'd be much safer to just suck it up and relocate. I don't think that I've been able to sleep knowing some kind of monster was even within a few miles of us. It was definitely the weirdest and creepiest thing we'd ever ran into while out hiking, and although it was just the one time anything like that happened, it certainly made a huge impression on us. After that, we were always very much aware that national parks don't just attract wholesome hiker types. They can attract some pretty messed up people, too. Ben was missing. That became the highlight of our trip. What was supposed to be a peaceful trip turned into a nightmare before our eyes. I wondered if he was just lost, or something else was the cause of it. Ben! The three of us shouted at the same time. I heard a strange noise behind me and turned back, but I was only staring into blank space. Felicia looked as troubled as I was. Jeff was trying to play it cool, being the guy and all, but deep down I knew different questions were running through his mind. Felicia had suggested that we divide and conquer, but it felt like a dangerous way to find a solution. We were only three which meant that one person would have to be alone, and if something happened by any chance, we wouldn't even know because no one was there with the person. We kept shouting, hoping to hear a reply from him somehow, but there was nothing. Just silence and nature's elements. We kept walking in a straight line, Jeff in front, myself behind him, and Felicia after me. Felicia must have felt something which made her turn and scream. By the time I turned, she was no longer there. Jeff... I said in a quiet and scared voice, Felicia's gone. Those two words were enough to convince us that we made a mistake the minute we decided to go camping. It was just the first day on our hike and things were already happening that we couldn't fathom. Ben was gone and so was Felicia with no explanation. Nothing to tell us what was happening or why it was. Quickly, my mind thought of so many things we could do that would make the disappearing act stop. We have to keep a straight line. Yes, let's hold hands then. That would make us know when something's happening behind us, I suggested. Jeff didn't argue. He couldn't. It was the only best possible option, and nothing else seemed like a reasonable solution at the moment. Quickly, we held hands and walked ahead, shouting and hoping one of them was going to reply to us. There was no point trying to think about what was going on. The only thing we were focused on was the solution we were trying to find. Finally, after a long time of yelling, we heard the muffled voice of Felicia, or so it sounded. It was a human screaming, and it was enough of us. Enough to make us drop each other's hand and run towards where we heard the voice. I turned around to say something to Jeff, and he was gone. 
Gone. Unbelievable. We only left each other for one second to help someone, and he was gone. Gone. I repeated the word over and over in my mind with nothing else to make sense of it. I hugged myself, providing a kind of warmth for myself, which was almost pointless because I didn't exactly feel the heat I was trying to provide for myself. I thought about the divide and conquer solution we were trying to find. It didn't seem possible at that moment, but the end result of it, which we were scared about, was already happening. And unfortunately, I was at the receiving end. I didn't bother screaming again. Whatever was taking them was probably attracted to noise. What exactly it was, I didn't want to know. Also, I didn't want to seem mean and selfish by finding my way back to where we camped. If they somehow escaped and found their way to the campground, they would hate me. It was going to be forever, not just a one-time thing. I kept walking in circles. At least, that was what it looked like. Even if I tried to get back to the campground, it appeared I was lost. And Ben was the only one who was familiar with the area. No phones, no books, no pen, nothing that could have helped. We made stupid rules we thought was going to help us enjoy the vacation. Stupid rules that we should have thought about twice or many times. I kept looking back. Whatever took them could be lurking around the corner, and I wasn't ready to just go off the face of the earth. I couldn't remember if it was my mind playing tricks or something else, but I ran and screamed when I felt something grab my legs. It was quick, and it was almost unreal, and felt very much like a human being's hand because of the fingers and the flesh on the palm or whatever it was, they grabbed me. The heck? I yelled to myself quietly. I stayed where I was. It was quiet and clear unlike the other areas that were quite bushy. I almost sat, but decided against it. I couldn't be too comfortable in case something happened unknowingly. With the situation, I had to be ready to run. Camera. A weird voice said my name quietly and spookily, like they did in the movies. But for some reason, it sounded like a mixture of Ben, Felicia, and Jeff's voice. It was an answer, I thought. It seemed like whatever took my friends had already digested them and was using their voice as a disguise. I remained stuck to a point, but I didn't want to. I was almost at the point where I wanted to call out to whatever it was and tell it to take me like it did with the others. What else was left? What was I supposed to be doing alone if it didn't take me? The worst was that my parents were going to cry for months. Luckily, I was not the only child, which meant they had other guys they could look up to and not feel alone. My heart ached at that possibility. I didn't want to die, but it was becoming inevitable. Look, look over, over here. here! I heard the same voice behind me, louder and clearer. I froze. It wasn't one voice. It was three voices saying the same thing at the same time. I was too scared to turn around. Three beings were behind me three beings that took my friends. Were they going to fight for possession of my body to fill themselves? I made up my mind after a few seconds to turn around. I might as well see the things that killed me before it did. I turned around to see my three friends, laughing at me and looking entertained. Curl, we got you so well! Felicia was the first to talk. We've been planning this for months since you mentioned the camp, and Jeff started to speak. And it worked out better than we could imagine, Ben completed the statement. Though angry at them, I was glad they were fine. Ben, let's go back to the campground. They argued between themselves after the statement about if that was all I was going to say. That was all. I had nothing else to say to them. I could forgive them later when I was calmer. 